Folks, uh, have your Bible there, uh, please, in front of you. If you don't have a Bible with you, I've printed out the passage on the back of the, the handout as well. You can have it there. And we're going to read the first 16 verses of chapter 2. Before we read that, let me remind you what we learned about last week. Uh, we learned a little bit about the situation in Thessalonica and how Paul came to plant a church in that place. And you'll remember that his stay there was very short. It was probably only three weeks. And the, the Jews in the city were very jealous of Paul and, and what was going on in the building up of the church in Thessalonica. And so they caused an uproar and they arrested some of the Christians in that city. And so Paul, along with his companions, had to leave behind this young church, those who were young in their faith. And yet, it would appear from the first chapter of Thessalonians, of First Thessalonians, that they had a great understanding of the gospel. The first chapter, Paul focused on assuring the Thessalonians of their faith. He wanted them to know they were God's elect people. And he assured them by pointing them to things that were true about them. He namely demonstrated that they had a faith that works, a love that labours, and a hope that is patient. But these weren't just airy-fairy ideas. They were things that made a genuine difference in the lives of the Christians in Thessalonica. And this change in their lives was obvious for people to see. They, they had turned from idols, they served God, and they were waiting patiently for the return of Christ. Interestingly, it's this special uh, witness. It was a, a witness to the churches in the surrounding areas. They have become an example to the churches in the surrounding areas, and Paul commends them for that. Remember, he said, the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. Well, as we move to chapter 2, we're going to see that um, Paul does something similar, but not for the, Thessalon the Thessalonians. He wants to talk about his own conduct. So let's read together 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 1 to 16. This is God's word. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labour and toil, for labouring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when he received the word of God, which he heard from us, he welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is, in truth, the word of God, 
which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Amen. We thank God for his truth. Paul wants us to, to know what his conduct was like when he was in Thessalonica. And it would appear from the tone of, of what he's writing here that he has come under attack. People have been attacking the way that Paul behaved while he was there for those three weeks. He wants to defend his own conduct. This is how John Stott summarizes this section of 1 Thessalonians. And I think it's either today or yesterday um, is the 100th anniversary of John Stott's birth. Um, maybe some of you have heard of John Stott. John Stott was a minister, an Anglican minister in, in London, but really a, a kind of father figure to a lot of evangelicals across the UK. Um, this is what John Stott says about this section in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul's critics took full advantage of his sudden disappearance. In order to undermine his authority and his gospel, they determined to discredit him, so they launched a malicious smear campaign. By studying Paul's self-defense, it's possible for us to reconstruct their slanders. He ran away, they sneered, and he hasn't been seen or heard of since. Obviously, he's insincere, impelled by the basest of motives. He's just one of those phony teachers who tramp up and down the Ignatius way. In a word, he's a charlatan. He's in the job only for what he can get out of it in terms of money, prestige, or power. And so when opposition arose around him, he found himself in personal danger. He took to his heels, he ran. He doesn't care about you, Thessalonian disciples. He abandoned you. He's much more concerned about his own skin than your welfare. So that's the, the sort of thing that Paul is likely facing. And here in chapter 2, he mounts his defense. And it's helpful to see that Paul appeals to the Thessalonians on the basis, again, of what they know. He tells them what they already know. If you scan through this chapter, in verses 1 and 2, Paul repeats, you know, in relation to his own behavior. It's the same in verses 5 and verse 11. You know. Verse 9, he says, you remember. And verse 10, you are witnesses. He also appeals to God as his witness. In verse, at the end of verse 5, God is witness. And verse 10, God also. You are witnesses, God also. Paul will not have these accusations that are being thrown at him. So he's defending himself on the basis of what the Thessalonians already knew about him. And that is the, the main thrust of this whole section. And so how does it relate to what we've titled our series, What Does a Christian Look Like? Well, according to Paul, in this section, a Christian is someone who lives out what they believe. That's what Paul did. That's what he commended the Thessalonians for in chapter 1. A Christian is someone whose life matches their belief. Verse 12, he says to the Thessalonians, he wants them to walk worthy of God, who calls them into his own kingdom and glory. Walk worthy of God. It's an action. It's, it's what you do. You believe it in your heart. You understand it in your head, believe it in your heart, but you have to live it out in your life. I wonder, could we say that about our lives? Could we say to people, you, you know how I've behaved. You know how I've acted when I've been with you. 
Could you say, verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly I behaved among you who believe. I would struggle to be able to say that. This is a challenge to me. Paul is refuting these allegations by pointing out, you were with me, you saw how I behaved for those three weeks, and his behaviour matches with his doctrine. And that's a biblical principle. I'm sure you know 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Peter teaches, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul, having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. When people speak against you as evildoers, you can say, no, no. You can see how I'm living. There's no evil in what I'm doing. This is not going out to those watching us. It's, it's not a positive or, or active means of witnessing. It's simply living a life that is in keeping. It, it matches the things that we believe. So that when people do accuse us of doing wrong, and Peter says they will, then they have no ground to stand on. Another way to put it would be, practice what you preach. Or at least practice what you believe. So that your life is consistent with what you believe. Paul has already commended Thessalonians, as I've said, for doing that in chapter 1. Their belief had a huge impact on their lives. In this passage, Paul turns the lens on himself. He examines his own conduct. How did he behave when he was among the Thessalonians? Even though it was only for three short weeks. And he uses three pictures to explain his conduct. Each one is helpful for us to understand the Christian life. In verses 4 to 6, the picture is of a steward or an ambassador for God and his word. If you look at the start of verse 4, this is how Paul begins to describe himself and Silas. He says, we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So Paul wants the Thessalonians to know that they weren't in this for themselves. He and, he and Silas weren't gaining anything for themselves, nor were they even preaching their own message. They were men who had been entrusted with the gospel of God. They were there to share God's message and to extend his kingdom. In verse 6, he says, they could have made demands. After all, they are, Paul is an apostle, but they didn't. They didn't make demands. They simply shared what had been given to them by God to share. So this image of a steward or an ambassador is a really helpful one. Uh, let me tell you a story to illustrate it. I was at a presbytery meeting as an assistant in Railway Street in Dromore Presbytery. And one of the ministers, uh, Shaw Thompson, some of you may know Shaw, uh, was retiring. This was his last presbytery meeting. And uh, his closest neighbour in the presbytery uh, couldn't be there. He had a personal situation came up. He couldn't be there that night to say something about his friend on the occasion of his retirement. And so what he did was he phoned up another minister in the presbytery and he dictated his speech word for word down the phone to this other minister so that that man could give the speech at the presbytery meeting for Shaw Thompson's retirement. Now, the person who took that message to presbytery, he had to relay that message. He couldn't just sit there and stay silent the whole meeting. He had to say something. He'd been entrusted with something and he had to share it. But he couldn't change the message either. He had to share it, and he had to share exactly what had been given to him. It wouldn't have been fair. 
either to the person receiving the message or the person who sent it. So you see the point. This, he was acting as an ambassador, a steward. He simply received the message and he passed it on. That's what an ambassador does. They receive the message of the king and they pass it on. They can't stay silent, nor can they change the message. And that's what Paul is telling the Thessalonians. That's how it was for him. He'd been given a message by God and he shared it. He didn't change it, but he had to share it. Without worrying about trying to impress people or making the demands or meeting other people's demands, they simply shared the message. I think there's something freeing about that for us. We're trying to, to seek to share the gospel with people. It's easy to get sucked into the trap of trying to please people, but trying to win their favor. Paul says he didn't do any of that. He didn't use flattering words. He didn't seek glory from men. He simply shared the message, the good news. Jesus is the Christ. He has died for the sins of his people. He has risen again to bring us new life. I think it's freeing to know that when you share the gospel, even if it's as simple as inviting someone to church, you don't have to come up with fancy words. You don't have to try and impress them. You just share the message that God has entrusted to you. In the next picture, if we move to verses 7 to 9, Paul is clear that he's not trying to flatter anyone, but he was keen that people knew the message of the gospel comes with love and with encouragement. In verses 7 to 9, he explains the way that he behaved towards the Thessalonians was like a mother, a mother who loves her children. And then verses 10 to 12, he says he's like a father who encourages his children. So let's look at verses 7 to 9 again. Another really helpful picture. Paul says he was gentle among the Thessalonians, like a nursing mother. Verse 8, I think, just paints the picture for us. Affectionately longing for you, we were pleased to impart not only the gospel, but also our own lives, because you have become dear to us. Think about a nursing mother. She genuinely shares her life with her baby. She, she feeds that baby with milk from her own body. She is sharing life with that child. But not only that, more than that, every waking moment for that mother is about the baby. She thinks about the baby constantly. And everything she does is with the baby's interests at heart. When a woman becomes a mother, her life is gone. Her life is over. She's living for the good and the benefit of another. Her life belongs to the child. And that's the picture Paul is painting of how he lived among the Thessalonians. There is a deep love, a tender concern from Paul towards these people in Thessalonica. And that's what a Christian looks like. What does a Christian look like? It's someone who's pleased not only to impart the gospel, but to share their life with another. That means in the church community we live and act as family. We, we share life together. Now, at the moment, at least, we have to do it in socially responsible and socially distanced ways. But we show hospitality to one another. When we're able, we open our homes with one another. It's, it's not rocket science, and probably most of you do it already. Certainly, whenever we moved into the area, we've seen the hospitality that's shared here. We share with one another. We share our time, our energy, our expertise with one another. We help out on each other's farms. We ease one another's burdens. We call one another on the phone. 
We look after those who are suffering. And we celebrate with those who are joyful. We mourn with those who mourn. We, we weep together, we sing together, we share life. The ups and the downs. Showing affection and care. Like a nursing mother with her baby. Well then, verse 9 puts an interesting slant on the picture. It's just another little idea that's useful to think through. Paul says, You remember, brethren, our labour and toil for labouring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Paul and Silas loved and cared for the Thessalonians. They shared life with them, but they didn't want to be a burden to them. The sharing of life wasn't meant to be an unwanted imposition into the lives of others. Paul and Silas were not demanding of the Thessalonians. And I think that's something that we can learn from too. Sharing life is important, but it's about giving, not about getting. Each one of us who call ourselves Christians, who believe and trust in Jesus, well, we have already received an abundance of blessing from Christ. We have received from Jesus everything we need. Paul is keen to point this out. It must have been something he was accused of, that he was there to gain, but he wasn't gaining anything for himself. He was there to give his life, to share the gospel of God. So what does a Christian look like? Well, a Christian is an ambassador of the gospel of God. And a Christian is a nursing mother. And finally then, in this section, in verses 10 to 12, Paul says, you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. Now, a few years ago, whenever I was assistant minister in Railway Street, we sent Toby to mini rugby in Lisburn. And one of the things that was sent out with the welcome pack was a copy of the laws of rugby football. And there was an instruction in the email that said, judging from the behaviour of some of the fathers the previous year, they needed to brush up on the laws. I think it was done tongue in cheek, but you can imagine you know, that, that picture of an over-enthusiastic father running up and down the side of the pitch, shouting instructions to their five-year-old who's just saw something shiny and wants to go and chase it. That's the sort of picture that Paul's giving here except it's in, in a much more positive light. It's that over-enthusiastic father. He just, he just loves the Thessalonians. And while he was with them, he exhorted them, he comforted them, and he charged every one of them. I want to say two things about this before we move to the, the final few verses in our passage. This is what a Christian looks like. A Christian is someone who exhorts and comforts and charges others within the church. We should be a constant source of encouragement to one another. We should be pushing one another on in the Christian faith to, to grow and to deepen in our knowledge and love of Christ. Isn't it so sad when we see people in the church falling out and arguing about things? That's not how church should be. We're to be like fathers with one another. And I hope we would be patient fathers in this regard. I can be a cross father at times, but that's not what Paul is saying here. He's talking about the type of father I want to be. A father who's patient with his children. Who understands that his children are children. <laughs> They're going to get things wrong. And that's what people are like in church. We need to be patient with each other. Because I'm going to mess up, folks, and you need to be patient with me. I will feel at things. But in those times, we keep on comforting. We keep on exhorting. We keep on charging. So that we all develop and grow together. That's what a Christian looks like. That's what we need to be in the church. Someone who's patient keeps on encouraging no matter how many times we feel them. The second thing I would say about this picture is to notice 
four words in the middle of verse 11. Every one of you. Every one of you. I am sure there were people in Thessalonica who frustrated Paul. There must have been people who clashed with his personality and who got on his nerves. But he acted as a father towards every one of them. Isn't that the way we should be in the church? It's not possible that everyone will click with everyone else, that we're all going to be best buddies. That's not possible. But we should seek to comfort, exhort and charge everyone. Everyone who is part of the body of Christ, as a father does with his children. A father doesn't make distinction with which child he comforts. He comforts all his children. He's not, he, he, he's not treating them all the same. A father doesn't treat all of his children the same. He treats them as individuals. Every child has their own personalities and quirks and that affects how we might comfort them, how we might charge them, how we might encourage them. But we do it for all our children, don't we? So that's what a Christian looks like. That's how Paul behaved in Thessalonica. Last week we saw how the Thessalonians behaved. This is how Paul behaved. He was an ambassador for the gospel of God. He had to share the message and he couldn't change it. He was a mother sharing his life. And he was a father encouraging every one of God's people. But as we move to a close, Paul gives us one last picture of what a Christian looks like. In verses 13 to 16, he makes some big connections. In, in chapter 1, he commended the Thessalonians for the way they live out the truth of the gospel. Verses 1 to 12, he spoke about his own life and conduct. But now he turns to something that connects all Christians. Something that should be common for all believers. And in fact, something that we share with Jesus himself. And that is suffering. When the Thessalonians accepted the word of God as the very word of God, and they put their trust in Jesus. It resulted in arrests and it resulted in imprisonment. Almost immediately, within three weeks. It resulted in Paul and Silas having to sneak out of the city by night. But Paul says this is a shared, this is a common experience for the church. In verses 14 and 15, Paul outlines for them that their suffering comes Confirms their faith. It makes them like the churches in Judea. It makes them like the faithful prophets of the Old Testament. It makes them like Paul and his companions. They all suffer physically, emotionally, spiritually for the sake of the gospel. But most importantly, it makes them like Jesus. Verse 15. Jesus was not only killed for the sake of the gospel, he was killed in order to make the gospel a reality. Friends, I believe the time is getting ever closer when we as Christians in Northern Ireland will have to suffer for the sake of the gospel. 20 years ago, our challenge was to try and show people that the gospel is relevant to their lives. And it hasn't stopped being relevant, but that's no longer our starting point with people, is it? Times have changed so much that we're going to suffer for holding on to the gospel, which people see as bigoted and as unpleasant and intolerant. But Paul says to the Thessalonians, that's how you know you're doing it right. If you're suffering these things, the accusations of being bigoted and unpleasant, well then you're suffering the same things that Jesus suffered. But in the face of all that suffering and accusation, don't forget that we should keep our life consistent with our belief. Because again, that's what Jesus did. 
Jesus is the truth. Capital T. There's no deceit in him. He lived a life which was perfectly consistent with the things he said. So he is our example. Jesus is the one who shared the word of God most clearly as an ambassador. He is the word of God. He shared his life as a mother, laying it down on the cross to save us. He's the one who sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we might be comforted and encouraged in the Christian life. So, let me finish with this. What does a Christian look like? A Christian looks like Jesus.